I can uh, start off by uh, sharing with you, as I said, we're the only slavery museum in Philadelphia and the only museum with actual slavery artifacts that were used during the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we have an extensive number of iron shackles and, and uh, manacles and branding irons and other forms of ironware that were used to restrain captured and enslaved Africans brought from uh, Africa to uh, the uh, United States and quite frankly, all over the world. Yeah. Um, and to be able to see these items really makes you understand how different coming to America was for Africans as opposed to other immigrants who came here voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So um, we're very proud of our collection and we use it to tell the uh, history, uh, uh, tell this portion of American history, which I stress as American history and not black history uh, because you can't talk about um, American history and leave out the 400 years of uh, bondage um, that was inflicted on uh, enslaved Africans. We are very much a part of the uh, American experience, but we share it from the uh, enslaved Africans viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We tell truth and it's hard um, to argue with truth, especially when we have the receipts, which are these uh, iron objects that you see before you today. As a matter of fact. Oh, wow, yes. These are actual middle passage shackles that were used on the uh, slave ships and other mm -hmm. forms of uh, shackles that you see before you today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are uh, wrist shackles that you see here. Right. And these are uh, shackles that were used on a Southern plantation. Mm -hmm. And these are quite unique. Many people never saw anything like uh, these artifacts. These are actually what they call runaway slave shackles. If a slave ran away and was caught, they right. would bring him back and put this around his or her ankle. And every time that slave moves, you could hear them. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah, they would send dogs after you to uh, bring you back. Oh, and of oh, course, they had uh, uh, rewards uh, put up on, uh, bond, bonds uh, actually put up on these uh, uh, Africans who had run away. Sure. This shows you uh, pictures of how emaciated many of the slaves were when they arrived because we sometimes get uh, um, questions about well, who could fit these the, these shackles where there was no one size fits all? Right. You may the, the African, the enslaved Africans may start off very healthy and, and, and heavy, but by the time they got to their final destination, they were uh, pretty much emaciated. Mm. I'm gonna go over here and show you the uh, first shackle that inspired my husband, J. Justin Ragsdale, who is the founder of Lest We Forget Slavery Museum to start collecting these th items. He started collecting these items over 50 years ago. Mm. He was always interested in history, but primarily history as related to the African uh, experience. He quite frankly wanted to know how his people got here. It wasn't something that he learned in school or in the books that he read, and he was a voracious reader. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, back in the 50s, when he was growing up here in Philadelphia, his family used to send him south to spend time with his great uncle who lived in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Now, back then, that was a great tradition when colored people, as we were called, then used to send their children south to spend time with their uh, relatives. It was a great um, uh, opportunity to learn your family history. We've gotten away from it because many of our people either uh, migrated north or passed on. But this is his Uncle Bub. Mm -hmm. And this is a shackle that he found in his Uncle Bub's trunk, which we have here in the museum. Wow. Mm. Wow. Now, Uncle Bub never said he was a slave. But the stories that he told my husband uh, made him believe that he quite possibly was, particularly since he lived to be 109 years old. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And where else would he have gotten the shackle? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And he never showed your husband this when never he was said, alive. Never, he wouldn't even let my husband go near the, the, the uh, trunk. Every time my husband would go near it, he would chase him away. Wow. But uh, after he died, my husband was in his early 20s when he decided to go back to Rock Hill to see if he could find the house that he had spent so many fond memories with his Uncle Bub. He had a hard time finding the house at first because a tree had actually fallen over on the house and, and the house was pretty much buried under the tree. But because he was familiar with the area, he persisted and he found the trunk. Once he did that, he uh, pulled it out, started plundering through it, and eventually came across this uh, shackle. My husband traveled the world primarily looking for uh, slave shackles. And these are actual branding irons that were used to uh, brand the uh, slaves who were sold to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. um, some he uh, actually uh, 
purchased um, later on when the internet became available. Some he purchased on, on eBay and or from other collectors. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, some of many of the collectors of these items are ca Caucasians. My mm -hmm. husband started collecting um, by hooking up with a group of Confederate uh, uh, collectors who yeah. were going back to former um, Civil War sites. Mm. And um, the first uh, 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 iron uh, metal detector that he got was given to him by one of those collectors mm -hmm. who just found him you know, to be interesting. They thought that he was a Civil War buff as well. Right. But my husband was actually looking for uh, slave shackles. Yep. He tells me of a story when he was one time in the barn uh, in a former slave plantation. And one of the uh, white guys threw, a, uh, threw something at him. He said, here, Joe, you seem to be very fascinated by all these uh, chains and things. Here's a horse bridle and threw it at him. But when my husband looked at it, he realized that it wasn't a horse bridle, but an actual slave shackle. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. Well, back to your husband's uncle, um, Bob. So, had has he explained what it must have felt like when he found that item? Well, actually, yeah. Actually, like I said, it intrigued him and made him want to collect more slave shackles and other forms of ironware that you see before you today. This is actually a shackle that allowed them to uh, uh, transport four or five uh, enslaved Africans all at the same time. These oh. shackles that I'm showing you here are actual shackles that were used on the boats during the Middle Passage. Uh -huh. These are shackles that would be used uh, perhaps on plantations like this one. Uh -huh. This was used on a, 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 a plantation, maybe a, a slave who had just been brought from auction right. to just right. keep him contained. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This uh, here, I'll show you in here. Mm -hmm. This is an actual uh, slave... Uh, an auction. Wow. It reads A. Goldman and Son Slave Auctions, Atlanta, Georgia, 1853. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious too about when you do, and you said you, you never really got any negative reactions from going in school. Did people become sort of, were kids like kind of overwhelmed a little bit? Were there ever those kind of reactions? Like, oh my gosh, this is really not only kids, but adults, not only kids, but adults. Many oh. adults become very, uh, overwhelmed um and that's white or black because i have to tell you to be perfectly honest with you the uh our tours are very frank and uh we don't pull any punches we don't want people leaving here thinking that slavery was a good thing and that these were happy people and they just did what they had to do no slavery was brutal it was horrible yep. these people were literally brutalized and in many cases worked to death you know, so I remind people that you've come to the Museum of Slavery, uh, that the word slavery is in our jingle. This is not the Museum of Butterflies and Dinosaurs. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. These are actual whips that were used to beat the slaves. Oh, my God. Wow. Mm. Yeah, you um, you also mentioned about the George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests. There's a connection, obviously, with the slave catching patrols in the early days, correct? Absolutely. These are, uh, this is an actual uh, photo. Sorry for my lighting here. No, no, it's fine. Showing you how uh, that officer stood on his uh, oh. neck for almost uh, 10 minutes or, yep. and watched him die. But it was not unusual because during lynchings, you had these uh, white uh, people who looked directly in the camera with no fear of retribution right. uh, because they knew that, that nobody was going to come after them. Many of them were law enforcement officers themselves. Oh so God. though much has changed, much right. has remained the same. But right. uh, Steve, Steve, is what you said? Is that yes. your name, Steve? Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, these are actual slave badges, mm -hmm. slave tags. A slave actually had to have permission to be off the plantation but he was often leased out to uh, work at an, another plantation the following day, but he had to walk at night to get to that plantation in the morning. And they would have uh, white men who self-designated themselves to become slave patrollers. And they would stop them and say, show me your tag or paper, nigger. And if you didn't have one, you could be beaten, oh sold God. back into slavery, or worse, killed. Oh my God. This was during slavery. And this started the uh, slave patrols was the start of American policing. Oh my Today, God. we have laws in the book called Stop and Frisk uh, that yes. allow police officers, white or black, to stop anybody who they deem suspicious. And most of those people are black and brown men. 
Mm-hmm. And we've watched those altercations in many, in many situations become deadly. Mm-hmm. So again, though much has changed, much has remained the same. Mm-hmm. Here's some uh, more slave tags and mm-hmm. overseer tags. Mm-hmm. And they didn't always use a white man. Sometimes the uh, master of uh, the plantation owner would use his most dutiful slave uh, to watch over, uh, to oversee his slaves. And he was far more brutal than many of the white men because he wanted to prove to that slave master that uh, um, he uh, uh, was uh, loyal to him. Yeah, I noticed that one of the photos you showed with the crowd standing around the lynch mob uh, mm-hmm. was in Coatesville. That's right, just outside of Philadelphia. Oh my God. So not all, which goes to prove that not all of these uh, horrendous acts happened in the South. Many of them happened in the North, mm-hmm. right. you know? Yeah. That was Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Oh my yeah. God. This is because uh, it's much okay. easier now because it's much easier to sort of point the finger down south and say, "Oh, it was really bad down there." Yeah, yeah, and redirect yeah, people's mm-hmm. attention. Absolutely, this is triple lynchings of uh, three men who were lynched together. Maryland. You know, Maryland. Yeah. Oh my God. This is uh, obviously what you can see is the uh, Ku Klux Klan robe. Mm-hmm. Oh, how on earth did he get a KKK robe? Actual original KKK robe that was given to us by oh. a white man who said his father was a devout member of the Klan. Oh. Mm. Oh. But he was so ashamed that he never told his children or grandchildren. He left it uh, uh, folded up in a box in the attic. He said, but I'm getting old and I want you to pl- please put this in your museum and let your people know that not all white people are racist. And we know that to be true. All white people are not racist, but there were so many of them that were that uh, this was the first um, white national white nationalist uh, organization in America, the Klan. Yeah. I was uh, introduced to the Klan when I was a young girl. When I uh, saw in the news this young boy who was uh, lynched by a, a group of uh, Klaners, yep. who a white woman accused him of whistling at her or um, winking uh, at her. Her story kept changing. Yep. Of course, his name was Emmett Till. Mm-hmm. When his mother saw his body, he was so mutilated that she insisted that they have an open casket so she could, so the world could see what they did to her beautiful uh, son. Mm-hmm. That woman who accused him of whistling at her just a couple of years ago just acknowledged that she lied. Oh. Lost her great grandson to uh, drug abuse and said that now she could understand how that mother must have felt. I just wonder, you know, where was her compassion 50 some years ago? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And Amen. more recently, this young boy, Trayvon Martin, was killed just walking in his neighborhood carrying a bag of Skittles and a drink. Yes, he was. The man who killed him, the man who killed him sold the gun that he used to kill Trayvon Martin on eBay. Often it also got sixty-five thousand dollars. So again, it just goes to show how much things remain the same. Mm-hmm. Many of these lynchings were turned into postcards. Oh that whites would purchase to send home to their uh, families up north. This one reads, this is the barbecue we had last night. Mm. My picture to the left with the cross over it. That man was literally burned alive. And they would sell body parts like burnt toes, burnt fingers, crispy yeah. hearts and crispy livers to uh, many of the uh, uh, attendees. They actually let people know that there was going to be a, a lynching or a burning today. This one shows you that 3,000 will burn Negro. Mm. Many people came, and oftentimes they had their uh, children, mm. children in uh, uh, with them as well. You know, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Fantastic. how we uh, how we tie in the uh, um, Black Lives Matter movement is to make people understand that were it not for those compassionate whites that we show here in our Underground Railroad site, like Levi Coffin, and who worked along with uh, uh, other uh, whites. Of course, we know about Harriet Tubman and, and Frederick Douglass, mm-hmm. but it was these compassionate whites and blacks who worked together to abolish slavery, like William Lloyd Garrison, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and uh, Martin Delaney. And we compare it to these, uh, uh, many of them young white allies who marched last summer during the Black Lives Matter protests, they certainly weren't racist and many of them volunteered to be in the front lines to, so that the cops wouldn't be so quick to attack them as they might if they were uh, Blacks in the front of the uh, lines. Mm-hmm. So these are what we call our white allies. They're like modern day abolitionists, quite frankly. 
Right. We uh, talk about the uh, N word, mm -hmm. and we, which is used much too much in our uh, communities today. These are items featuring the N word. This is a can of uh, smoking tobacco called Nigger Hair Tobacco. Mm. Or this is an mm. advertisement for black boot polish called Nigger Boot Polish. Mm. Or this one, uh, a label that's on a, a, a shrimp, a can of shrimp called Nigger Head Shrimp. That mm. word wasn't created by black people. That word was created by oppressors of black people. And every time we use it, we disgrace our ancestors. We just hope in this uh, uh, um, upcoming uh, um, group of young Gen Xs and millennials that they'll realize the harm of that word and will stop using it. Because now you have white kids who use the word to call each other that word mm -hmm. because it's so confusing, you know? And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether that word comes out of the mouth of a black person or a white person. It's, mm -hmm. it's disrespect of self and of our ancestors. I'm sure that when people come through your museum, they're obviously profoundly affected. What, what do you suggest to them as far as there any reading or further study or things they can do to sort of educate themselves a little bit more about what's happened? Well, we do have some books that we have listed that we have on our website that people uh, you know, can read that will help them better understand where we are today. You know, White Fragility is one of my uh, uh, a uh, favorite ones that I uh, uh, refer to because it really makes white people understand um, what happened and makes them also understand why they may feel the way they feel. You know, white supremacy is something that is innate. You know, it's ingrained in, in, in most white people. It's just a matter of that's just what is expected. You know, just what, what so they don't, they don't know that that's, uh, they don't even know in many cases that they are privileged because of their white skin. But they are, in fact, uh, um, uh, it is, in fact, uh, something that they should be mindful of. This is a, a painting that we show to make people understand how slavery has affected our Black communities. If you notice here in this painting, the shackles are not on the man's ankles or on his wrists. They're on his head, which signifies mental slavery. There's an actual book with a key over it. All he has to do is open that book and read and get the knowledge that he needs. Mm. And as a result of mental slavery, this is what's happening in many of our communities today. Mm. We have blacks, these are obituaries of young black men oh, no. mm. who were killed in recent years. And they weren't killed by white cops. They weren't killed by uh, vigilantes. They were killed by other black men. Mm. So we asked the question, what is the difference? Killed by others or killed by brothers? Slavery literally taught us self-hatred, and now it's become so self-hating that we kill ourselves. Mm. Mm. So this is also uh, very profound. And we talk about, yes, Black Lives Matter, but it also has to matter to us. We have to be just as vigilant about uh, Blacks killing Blacks as we are about white killing Blacks. Our people are literally dying from lack of knowledge. Mm. This is slavery yesterday, and this is slavery today. Are there any uh, expectations or assumptions that people have that you've had to correct? I mean, do you have people coming in with sort of some real misconceptions that you've noticed? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you a, 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 an experience I had just last summer. And I had a grandmother and grandfather who was visiting Philadelphia with their grandchildren. And they saw my uh, brochures at the visitor center. And they said, oh, we'd like to go to the uh, slavery museum. So they came up here to Germantown. And uh, uh, I'll turn my uh, phone back around. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could tell as soon as uh, they walked in, the grandfather was just, you know, going along to get along. But the grandmother was very, very, uh, you could tell she wasn't happy about being here. But the grandchildren, they were clinging on every word that I said. Oh. And uh, as I talked, she kept, you know, uh, grabbing her virtual tour pearls and mm -hmm. clearing her throat a lot and... Um, when we got to uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, uh, robe, she shouted out, oh my God, did anybody survive this? At first mm -hmm. I thought she was joking mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know what to say quite frankly. And finally, I finally said to her, ta-da! <laughs> I mean, I, she was so clueless. Yeah. She really did not under, she didn't know anything about slavery and probably didn't want to know, but she was uncomfortable to the point where she just simply blurted out her ignorance. And that was ignorant of her, you know, to ask, did anybody to survive this? 
her children, her grandchildren burst out laughing. Her husband, as they were leaving, apologized to me. I said, no need to apologize. There are many people like her. What you just have to do is educate yourself about slavery and this portion of American history. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that just that started a discussion at the very least uh, in that family. And it seems as though there's a generational thing as well, where you've got the grandkids who understand it as right. you grasp it more. Uh, that's got to give you some hope. You're absolutely right, Steve. In fact, we have become known as uh, one of the few museums where it's a safe place to have conversations and talks about race and race relations. You know, following my presentations, people are just some at some time so not not well overwhelmed with uh, feelings that they want to talk. They start asking questions. They start mentioning, you know, things that they uh, learned from their grandparents or their parents, you know, growing up and how they have come to realize that what they were taught were a, a pack of lies, quite frankly, about black people. Because, you know, you have college students who are now going to college with uh, bl black uh, uh, people, black people, and realize that they're no different than them, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, th there are a lot of conversations that uh, just spontaneously happen. And we're glad that people feel comfortable enough to talk about that. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you keep it uh, straight, so to speak, how you don't try to soften it. And you really want to have, you know, tell people that this is exactly what happened. And you're, you're fighting sort of uphill against some of that revisionist history that some of these people are coming in who have learned. Absolutely. Speaking of revisionist history, I can't help but, uh, and I'm sure you've heard of the uh, 1619 Project written oh, by yes. uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Oh, yes. she, really, she really exposed um, how slavery, uh, well, first of all, how it started 400 years ago. We celebrated the 400th anniversary last year. Mm -hmm. um, but now uh, this last administration uh, came up with the 1776 Commission <laughs> which served to um, just erase everything about slavery. They made out like it was just a given and how slavery was needed and, 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 and they're trying to put it in the schools. It's a lie, mm -hmm. it's all lies and we can't allow that to happen. We've already lost too many generations uh, uh, that bought into uh, these lies. We must tell the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. Here's the article written by Ta-Nehisi Coates about 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, and how redlining and all these other lies and all these other legislations just keep black people um, suppressed. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like black people didn't want to uh, uh, get ahead, but they were left out. They were left out of the equation, just like we were left out of the equation when the, when the uh, uh, founders wrote the uh, constitution. How are you adjusting then with uh, the COVID lockdown? Are you are you able to reach out to schools? Uh, in, in well, in lieu of in lieu of our traveling exhibits, we are now offering uh, live virtual tours, and I literally walk them through the museum just like I'm doing now, mm -hmm. and showing them everything, and I'm presenting to them just as I would if they were were here. So it's the next best thing to being here, um, uh, despite the, the COVID. So a lot of teachers have taken advantage of that. We're almost booked for Black History Month. Uh, we still are in the uh, habit of waiting uh, 28 days out of the year to talk about this portion of our history. But I encourage people to understand that um, Blacks should not be ashamed of slavery. And this is something that we should be discussing 365 days a year. Yeah, definitely. Um, here's, another, here's another portion of our uh, exhibit where we talk about the Jim Crow yeah. era hmm. when items and legislation were created to just make Blacks look inferior. These are salt and pepper shakers that many whites had in their uh, homes. Um, this pair here was given to us by a white woman who said she grew up with these on her grandmother's table. And she was so offended by him, by the, but her grandmother insisted on keeping them after her grandmother died. She donated it to the museum. And uh, so that we can teach, you know, people white and black and young and old alike, how Jim Crow, how the Jim Crow era just uh, fanned the fires of bigotry and created misconceptions of blacks, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. This is it sounds like you've also got a lot of interesting stories What's from people that? who are is that a game? donating. Yeah, this is an actual game, Carolyn, that would be given to uh, white kids to play with. It's the uh, concept is just like shoots and ladders in Candyland. But yeah. look at the title. <gasps> Darkie from the Mel Melon Patch. Oh my God, what, what year is this? Uh, what is the year is that? I had that on here somewhere. Let me see. More recent than you might think. I was, I'm always shocked when I hear that. 
1932. Holy moly. That's like a couple years before the um, uh, Wizard of Oz was filmed. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. my goodness. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's. And it's obviously propaganda. It's very art. It's artful, exactly you know. They, yeah, they they put their money into it. You know, you can see that Absolutely. they they didn't hold out on the illustration. There, it is. It is the best propaganda. This is they an actual uh, nineteen twelve calendar featuring a black man on the calendar. And they called the. It's an advertisement for toothpaste called Darky Toothpaste. Hmm. This tube here is an actual tube of toothpaste that my son bought back from Japan in wow. 2018. It's still on the market there today. Mammy jar. This oh is from my God. own collection. Yeah. Uh, there are two uh, black female celebrities uh, who you probably have heard of who also collect Mammy jars. They are Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, and you Oprah, I didn't know Whoopi. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I want you to notice these little salt and pepper shakers because there's some subliminal messages here. You mm -hmm. notice that they're all in servant positions, mm -hmm. cooks, yep. butlers, yep. you know, uh, yep. uh, nursemaids and things of that nature. No lawyers, no nope. doctors, nope. you know, no professionals, because no. this is this is how we were subjugated. This is what people thought of us. We were no better than uh, uh, being that's that's the, that's the most that we can become, you know. Right. And, and I think about the children that were in those houses that see these things. This was like at Sears. You could mm -hmm. buy them stuff. And mm -hmm. to me, that just blows me away. You know, the Irish were used as indentured servants. They right. worked right along the African slaves. As a matter of fact, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, which was the elite whites, mm. were not fond of Irishmen. Mm -hmm. They weren't, they didn't consider them very dependable. And they said that they were a bunch of uh, drunken brutes. Mm -hmm. So these Irishmen, in many cases, self-designated themselves to become slave patrollers. Okay. So that they could treat the uh, Africans, you know, uh, as if they were better than them. Right. You know, they started fighting over uh, housing and things, you know. Sure. So, uh, yes, the, the Irish uh, were, in fact, uh, indentured servants. A lot of people don't want to believe it, but it's true. Right. It's simply it's very true different that, these, uh, from that, that they were able. Right. Very so much so because they were given contracts yes. that they could work out of. Mm -hmm. or pay nominal amounts of money that they could pay for their freedom. Unlike Africans, we were slaves for life. Yes, mm -hmm. you were, yep. Mm -hmm. And, and you, it was always obvious because the skin color is a giveaway. That's right. Whereas a white guy could just slip into That's right. wherever he needed to be if he, if he wanted to. And again, that white guy is not being raised with constant images of a society that mocks That's right. you mm -hmm. and puts you down. And you know what's fascinating? You have a lot of uh, uh, white police officers today that have Scott Irish surnames. <laughs> right. They have maintained their roles in law enforcement. It's weird. Yeah. You know, when you That's explain right. how it started and how it's still here, it's it's the continuum is frightening. Yeah. That's right. And the other thing you mentioned about white privilege is how uh, if you go if it goes unexamined, you don't see these things in the in your landscape, in your worldview. But then the minute you right. see one thing or another thing, it starts to unravel. Right. The whole police history for me was completely fascinating and eye-opening how it began as a slave patrol. People need to be fact-oriented. You know, right. there's so many rumors out here that they have turned into, you know, their beliefs, right. which in fact, they're not, you know. Nope. I'm nope. sure you've all, I'm sure you both heard about Wall Street, a prosperous yeah. uh, black mm -hmm. town. They had their own doctors, their own lawyers, yep. their own bankers. And the whites literally burned it down because they were jealous. Yes, they did. Well, the Ragsdales, my uh, husband's family, had the uh, <gasps> building, had a business called uh, the Ragsdale and Sons. They had the first mortuary business there in Tulsa. And uh -huh. it was burned down as well. That's one of my husband's relatives there uh -huh. standing outside one of the uh, hearse. But the building, but the uh, business has been rebuilt and uh, now exists today in both Oklahoma and California. So oh, we were wow. a part of uh, history too. Oh, well, well good. done now. Well, well done. Yeah. They, yeah. They bounce back from that. Jeez. Absolutely. Again Absolutely. and again and again and again. It's like you can't, the, the people keep coming back and keep rising, which is, I That's think, right. probably the message, the positive message that I'm hoping that everyone is getting loud and clear from your museum as well. You, you, the look where you've come from. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. And not only that, not only that, Stephen, look at all of the, uh, Black inventions done by blacks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, look. I mean, you know, the uh, uh, gas mask, 
the get the, the traffic light, mm -hmm. all of these things, even the toilet, oh. the mailbox, all of these things were done by blacks. The filament in the electric bulb, that, that, that wasn't Thomas Edison, that was Louis Latimer, you know, mm -hmm. but you never hear them talk about him. And there are other more uh, uh, current inventions. This man here, the next time you go on the internet and you yeah. type in .com after the URL, uh -huh. you can thank this man. He came up with the scientific code for .com. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or this woman who you may have seen a, a, a movie made about her. Her name was uh, Katherine Johnson. She worked for NASA. Many of the astronauts wouldn't even go into outer space until she checked their figures. She died uh, early last year at 102 years old. Oh. NASA just named a building after her. All right. Oh, and wow. the movie that I mentioned was called Hidden Figures. Uh -huh. hmm. <laughs> in outer space. The first, Mae Jemison, the first black woman in outer space. Wow. But I bet you never heard of this man. Dr. Mark Dean, he worked for IBM and he came up with the invention for the personal computer, the PC, oh. Oh. the first laptop computer that we, uh, many of us use today, wow. you know? Wow. Or, or the fact that uh, Jack Daniels, the bourbon giant, just acknowledged when they were celebrating their 150th anniversary that it was a slave that taught Jack Daniels the recipe for uh, distilling uh, the famous bourbon. Yeah. And they now are telling the world about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's or how awesome. about this? I don't know how old you guys are, but I was old enough. I watched uh, The Lone oh, yeah. Ranger when oh, I was yeah. a young girl. The yeah. Lone Ranger was based on a black man, Bass Reeves, who became a famous sheriff in Oklahoma. But when they uh, did his uh, um, image, they created this uh, white man as the uh, uh, her hero. All right. Oh, wow. So you see how all these subliminal messages are, uh, can get into your head? But this yeah. one always gets me. This grandmotherly looking woman, Dr. Gladys West, one of the inventors of GPS technology. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> you know what I call this? What? We did it. They hit ah! it. <laughs> yes. Yep. Not right. anymore. This is great. I'm Absolutely. so glad you do. Yep. I make it current. I make it, I make it easy for people, not easy, but I make it so that they know that there is some truth there. You know, this can, you know, you have a uh, Holocaust deniers. How could you deny that Holocaust happened? You know, right. how could you deny that slavery happened? Right. You know, like I said, you can't look at all of these shackles and ironware and say that these were just something that was made up. No, nope. these didn't come from a movie set. Nope. All right. These are actual items that were used on enslaved Africans. And by the way, this is uh, uh, what we call the door of no return. Mm. They had forts that uh, were created that were, uh, 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 every country had their own fort that were located along the uh, coast of Africa. Mm -hmm. And this was the last site that an African would see before they were taken away from their country forever. Oh. This is an actual uh, 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 statue um, from Benin showing uh, an African in chains, which is very unusual because they don't usually show that, but he has chains on his, around his ankles and behind his back. And that mouthpiece was to keep him from screaming out uh, because they had so many slavers that they were taking him through the bush that they didn't want him to make noise that might attract the attention of other slavers oh. because they were busy um, bringing them. There were so many different Africans that were complicit in the slave trade, you know, so like I said, uh, we tell the truth. We let them know that yes, it was Africans uh, that became complaint, complicit in the slave trade, but it was based on lies. It, it was worked. based on lies. They had no idea that they were selling their, their people away forever. They thought they were simply taking them to another part of Africa. And do, I researched this, this, this uh, museum tour. So I was down a rabbit hole and they were comparing the Middle Eastern um, an African slave trade with the transatlantic slave trade. And they Correct. said that the ones that preceded transatlantic, and you can confirm this, I'm sure you know this, um, they, when it came to slavery, A of all, they didn't know how far they were taking them. And B of all, slavery was like, you became a member of somebody's family. And it That's wasn't right. like for life. It was That's for right. a particular- they were, never, they were never taken away from the continent. This shows you no. how the African, most the Arab Muslims, they yes. were the first to uh, start selling their uh, yes. captives of war. They were really captives of war yes. because there was warring going on all over the world. Yes. They were fighting in Ireland and Germany and other European countries. But when the Europeans came to uh, Africa, they uh, uh, 
started trading with the North African Arabs mm -hmm. and enlisted them to go into Africa to uh, purposely capture other Africans to enslave. But they did something that would change slavery in Africa forever. They gave them guns. Mm -hmm. Guns did not exist in the African culture before the Europeans introduced it to them. Right. Once they did that, then other African leaders, they wanted guns as well in order to protect themselves. So not only did you have the Arabs, you had the Moors and other African rulers who started selling their captives of war away as well. Yeah. Yeah. Much like they did with the indigenous peoples here. They were trading Absolutely. For, for guns. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and well, this talks about the three-fifths compromise that were written, written into law so that slavers would get credit for the number of slaves that they had, you know? Right. And again, legislation has played a critical role in how slavery was maintained. And it was always for uh, uh, the whites who, were, who wanted to keep slavery going. It was never to benefit the blacks who were enslaved. Mm -hmm. No, no, mm -hmm. no. They said the Electoral College is also have its base in the- Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Every one of these uh, presidents owned slaves, including <gasps> Ulysses S. Grant. He actually uh, uh, obtained a slave through his wife because most of the women used slaves as their dowry. But mm. uh, he soon sold the slaves soon after they married. Mm. 41 si signers of the Declaration of Independence owned slaves. Ironic. And during Reconstruction, look at all these black men who were elected into yep. Uh, Congress. Yep. But yeah. that's so that that's they they slowly or quickly I should uh, uh, ended that you know which put us right back into a, a, a subjugated position, mm -hmm. you know. Right, mm -hmm. they had to stop the voting, is what they did, right? They absolutely, absolutely. From them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is funny how we're right back there again. Right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Anything else people can do to get engaged with the museum or just to educate? Well, them? again, we would like you to come and visit us. We're open uh, Saturday, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Sunday, 12 to 4, but we do require appointments. You can call us at 215-205-4324, or you can go to our website, www.lw, F is in forget, S is in slavery, M is in museum.com, and book a tour online. Uh, and like I said, until we're able to uh, get back to our um, traveling slavery exhibits, we do offer our live Zoom tours, which you can give us a call to arrange for one, and we'll be glad to uh, accommodate you. We encourage people to come and visit us, um, uh, check out our uh, Zoom tours. We also have a virtual, a pre-recorded virtual tour, which you can also uh, purchase, which you can uh, find on our website as well. So. There's so many different ways and more importantly, or most importantly, I should say, because we are small and because we are not located in a historic building, we don't qualify for a lot of the uh, uh, grants that are out there. Most of the uh, grants for these other large museums, because they are in a historic site or located somewhere downtown, they get, get the Pew uh, grants and things. We don't qualify for things like that. So we uh, basically, you know, really require us you know, for donations, we ask people to donate to us. And it's very easy to do. You just go to our website uh, and uh, click on our donate button and donate to us. So uh, most of our collection, because we are in a much smaller location than we were when we were first located in uh, Port, Richmond, Port Richmond, much of our collection is in storage. Mm -hmm. And it's costing us an arm and a leg uh, to keep these things in storage. So uh, we ask people to make donations because there are times, quite frankly, that my husband and I, uh, have to decide, you know, whether to pay the mortgage one month or to pay for the uh, storage. But we can't afford to uh, lose our collection. So nine times out of 10, the storage always wins out. So we are desperately in need of uh, funding, uh, but we are also encourage you to come and see what we have. Just support us. I think I, think I stepped outside of my Wi-Fi. Yeah, <laughs> but I was just saying that I uh, produced and written two award-winning films one called Lest We Forget, which features myself and my husband. He talks about how the shackles were utilized. Mm -hmm. I talk about uh, the abolitionist period, the Jim Crow era. Mm -hmm. We won the HBO Martha's Vineyard Best Documentary Award for that film. Wow. The wow. other one is called My Slave Sister Myself, where I pay homage to the African woman who survived the Middle Passage, and I compare it to the strength of the day's Black woman. And it also shows how the Black man lost his uh, uh, manhood even before leaving the shores of Africa. That won two, uh, doc two awards. 
uh, the Toronto um, uh, Film Festival, as well as the New York uh, Film Festival. We wow. both won the Best Documentary Award for that film as well. Oh they're, av they're available online or you could purchase it on our website. And, and one of our uh, items, which is our, I actually should say our uh, best selling item uh -huh. is this booklet, little known black history facts booklet. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We talk about how Africans became complicit in the slave trade, how Wall Street was the first major auction site in America, how black whites were able to purchase life insurance to uh, uh, get their money back for many slaves that died. We have over 50 documents of little known history facts. How about this one? In parts of the Jim Crow South, blacks were not allowed to eat vanilla ice cream in public. Oh, I know, things, yes, ridiculous things, things that you may not found, find in most history books are in this booklet. Uh, this booklet uh, is $20, you can purchase it online, or again, uh, you can come to the museum and uh, purchase it as well. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Oh, fantastic. Oh, wow. I'm going to have to get my hands on that. Book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Gwen, for making time and for uh, giving us this tour. What a great collection you have there. Thank you, Stephen and uh, Carolyn. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, so, again, there's so much to learn here. And uh, I like to also make people understand that though slavery was a dark and tragic period in American history, acknowledging its existence and learning from the lessons will prevent history from repeating itself. Uh.